How's it going, y'all? Um, hope that you're having a good day or week and all those sorts of things. <laughs> um, we're going to be playing in the Corviknight Tour for this weekend using a really fun team that I am thinking about releasing next month. So we actually have a bit of a sneak preview here for what we're going to be doing next month. And that's pretty fun. I also figured that... <laughs> Phone went off. Um, I also figured that it would be a pretty good time to talk a little bit more about some of the uh, universal stuff that I wanted to talk about on my channel from time to time. So, you know, while I'm playing these matches, I'm going to see if I can try to go over some of the theories which I suppose I hold uh, very near to my heart because um, they contain really important information. Like, I don't know. Um, a lot of theories, you know, they're just theories, right? You can't prove them, but you can uh, categorically explain the conditions under which they make the most sense. Um, and in this case, um, it categorically makes the most sense in the type of universe that we think, uh, provably that we live in. So, uh, we can talk about that. That'll be fun. Um, but let's look at this team really quick. So, yeah, Calyrex, Trick Room, Hans Power, uh, Protect, Glacial Hans. Then we've got Senta Scorch, Flare Blitz, Leech Life, Coil, and Crunch. You might want Protect, I'm not gonna lie, like, but this, I don't know, it's a nice little move set. Like, you would definitely, if you're gonna take anything off, you take off Crunch, right? But, like, uh, I kind of like having Crunch. Um, let's see. Wide Guard, Protect, Liquidation, and Leech Life on Araquanid. Definitely a nice move set. Uh, Faint, Coaching, Counter, and Quick Guard. It's pretty interesting. Darkest Lariat, Fire Punch, Protect, and Self Destruct. I think I might have to take Crunch off of Senta Scorch now that I'm looking at this. Like, we have answers for Calyrex. And. It's probably not going to be sent to Scorch. So, yeah, I am going to try taking uh, Crunch off for Protect. It might bite me in the butt. But I think it's the, I think it's the move for now. Like, if anything, it'll... So, in the most inherent nature of the universe not, you know, assuming things is what I'm trying to say, um, is that the universe itself does not actually care about good and evil. Um, for the universe, it's kind of just like, if something happens, it happens. But there's not really like, there's not really like a better for the universe. I mean, technically, we could categorically say that like, the universe would rather be here than not be here and things like that, so, like, things that keep the universe thriving, um, are good for the universe, right, but, um, in general, it's not actually really, like, it really is just kind of, like, what happens, happens, um, <laughs> so, like, yo, what's going on, Tim, um, I'm trying to rattle off some of my beliefs about existence, uh, we're talking about life, and good and evil, um, talking about how for the universe, uh, there might not actually be, uh, life principles for the universe without life itself, um, meaning that the universe is kind of just happening, but the interesting thing, I guess, that falls into it that I've been trying to get around to and I'm playing games too much, um, is that, you know, we're people, obviously, and we have ways that we see the universe as being better to be happening, right? So, like, while we can think about on the universe's side, 
of existence, which is technically the the supervening level of existence, like the highest um, level of laws that really matter, right? Um, good and evil might not really be a thing. Um, but then when we think about people and what people... Um, when we think about people um, and what people desire or think is best for the universe, um, it kind of turns out, oh, this is going to be really bad. Um, yeah, exactly. Sorry, I'm just, like, me Me trying to do this while I'm playing is not easy. Um, so I'm trying to, like, think this through. <sighs> Who do I... I actually really like the idea of bringing Snorlax here. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is go this and... Hmm. Let's try bringing Scorch. Yeah, this team is pretty interesting. Sorry, so... Yeah, my, what I was saying is, for the universe, um, while there technically might not be good and evil, um, as beings in the universe, you know, even if the universe doesn't have, like, a desired way of being, we have a desired way of seeing the universe. So, we would like the universe to exist in certain states over another, and what that really does is, um... It, it, like, inserts our own influence into the world through the, like, guise of an idea of good and evil, whether or not good and evil is an actual thing, you know? Um, so pretty interesting. Uh, what can I do here? I might actually just... I think I'm just gonna protect and coaching. Oh, uh, but because we are beings that, you know, basically desire the world to exist in one state over another, um, what that does is, it, you know, it allows us to have a, I say, what? <laughs> God dang it, why? Oh, God, that's, that's frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so I mean, like, we have ways that we see the universe, right? Like, you, you want certain things to happen over another, right? Like, no killing people, no, um, you know, you make an agreement with other people and you, like, decide to follow it, which is technically, like, John Rawls' moral contractualism, I think. Um, so, like, in moral contractualism, it's like something is good when people agree that it's mutually beneficial for everybody um, that, like, follows the rule, right? So, like, John Rawls' contractualism goes into, like, uh, it's good that we all follow the rules on the road so that nobody dies. <laughs> oh, my God, why don't I have life orb? That's so frustrating. <sighs> Um, so let's see if they use Roar again. I'm going to be really interested to see if they use Roar. Um, if I had had Life Orb there, I would have just picked up a double KO, which I don't. Um, so let's see. They've got to use Roar again. Like, there's no way they don't. Okay.
the real question is, did I bring anybody who can stop them from yawning me? Um, the answer is no, which kind of sucks. And who do I bring out now? Do I bring out Snorlax? Do I bring out Scourge? Um, but yeah, sorry, no, I, I know that I, I came into this with the plan of, uh, explaining what I'm trying to think better, and I'm, I'm a little bit too in this game right now, but, um, let's think. But, so, the, the point that I was trying to get at, basically, is in the universe, we're in a really interesting position where if you use, like, it's really Okam's razor rule, and you say that, like, we can't actually prove that the universe has uh, life principles uh, intertwined in it, and more that, like, life is just an emergent phenomenon of the universe... Um, we find that even though there isn't good and evil, technically, like, even if there's nothing, even if good and evil isn't real for the universe, you know, we're still thinking beings, and we have a desired way of doing things, and that, like, within our own little microcosm does make good and evil an actually, like, effective thing that matters, right? Um... So, the interesting thing is, instead of, like, saying that there is no good and evil, the way that I would really put it is that there's nothing truly good and evil that isn't, um, it's, that isn't, um, what's the word? Biologically instructed or societally or intellectually constructed. So everything that's actually good and evil in the universe is either biologically instructed, meaning that, like, our bodies just kind of tell us that it's the right thing to do, um, or it's intellectually or societally constructed, meaning that people have decided that it's the right thing, basically. Um... So yeah, it could be societally or intellectually constructed, um, but no, there's a, there's a large biological factor to it, um, and that can't be that can't be misunderstood. So like, the the biological factor of good and evil is pretty much like the most the most important uh, factor of it, I guess I would say. Here's the pass on. Right, right, right. Yeah, so, like, through our biology, there is ways in which good and evil do still matter, but, um, and not only through our biology, but, but through our intellect and through society, because the society part is, like, John Rawls' moral contractualism, um, like, if we, you know, agree that something is good for us all to do and follow it, it, like, makes the world a better place. That's, like, the societal part of it. Um, the intellectual part of it being that we as beings can be so smart that we recognize that there's actual ways that we would like the universe to be rather than other ways. So, like, through our intellect, we can insert levels of good and evil by saying, like, I'm smart enough to know that I want this to happen and I know how to make it happen. Um, so, like, yes, there are ways that good and evil matter in the universe, but it's really, like, the interesting thing is, like, yes, we have our, like, we have within our own microcosm a way that we've made good and evil actually matter, but then when you, like, abstract back out to the whole universe... It just doesn't matter. Like, it's it's really just a, a rock smashing into things and people just doing stuff universe. Like, even though we deem things to be good and evil and we live within that, like, understanding, for the universe, it's still kind of just rock smashing into each other and stuff. So, like, 
technically, yes, there is no good and evil. Meaning, like, we... A good and evil is relative. Um, well, that's, that's not the only thing about it. But, like, yeah, so technically, it really is like a, you know, the good of the... The good of the zebra is not the good of the lion type of thing, right? Like, even if we think something is good for us, it's not always going to be good for everybody. There are types of good and evil that we can conceive of, like, what's the best thing to do for all of life itself? Um, and, and again, this all, it all comes back to, like, um, what's the word? Apprehension. Like, ways of seeing things that we desire to be one way over another. And so, like, even though for the universe there might not actually be good and evil, it doesn't really mean that, like, it's okay for you to do bad things, <laughs> you know? Like, so that's that's really the interesting thing that comes out of it is, like, even if we can sit here and hypothesize about the idea that, um, that there is no good and evil really in the universe, it doesn't really, like, there's no pragmatic application to it. Like, it doesn't tell you to just do whatever you want. Like, you still have to try to be a good person. <laughs> so even if there's no good and evil in the universe, it's it doesn't really matter. Like, you still have to kind of live within the, the paradigms of life itself because that's what we are. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, hopefully within my rambling uh that moderately made sense but um yeah so it's really like when you when you just think about it it's like okay so the universe very likely does not actually have anthropic principles in it meaning that for the universe which is like the ultimate state of the universe um there is no good and evil and then as an emergent phenomenon there is good and evil meaning that like arising within the complexities of existence somehow um there has come a state where like good and evil actually does matter um but the true nature of the universe is that good and evil doesn't matter the emergent phenomenon that we exist within is not only life itself um but good and evil ending up mattering so yes good and evil doesn't matter but because of our lives and the way that we live our lives you know we have to deal with good and evil mattering it does matter like so you can't just do anything you want and think like oh well good and evil's not real so like i'm gonna no like no <laughs> doesn't work that way um okay um eventually it might be fully biological um i don't really see it that way i don't think I don't think of the universe as being an actually biological place. Um, I think of somehow within all the complexities of the universe, life was able to start. Um, but yes, like if the universe was fully biological, meaning that like if the universe had um, anthropic principles active in it at all times, um, then yes, we could actually say that good and evil might matter because then there would be a certain like state of the universe that the universe wants to be in over another state um which is pretty cool but it's just not really i guess borne out in in our understanding of of the world um ooh, what do i do here Bring Riolu might not really work. Um, let's try Raquanid. Let's just not even bring a Riolu this time. Um, but so something that's really important to the idea of what I'm talking about, basically, is this idea that I mentioned of, like, 
emergent phenomenon versus a supervening state in the universe. So, we have multiple, like, I guess, like, levels of, of existence, right? Like, there's the, the true nature of the universe level. Oh, this is gonna be bad. Um... Yeah, like there's the there's the the ultimate state of the universe, right? Being like, what is existence actually like for the universe? And that's the state that really matters like the most in the end of things when we're trying to think about like the true nature of existence. Um, but then there is the other side of things being like the emergent phenomenon. So, oh my god, don't do that. That's bad. Ugh. So I have to trick room. This is going to be really bad. I have to trick room, and then I have to just flare blitz. It'd be really nice if I could just protect and flare blitz here and have them not use follow me, but the way that I see it is they probably use follow me. Okay. That's so bad. Why? Why? That's not great. So they should go into, yeah, the Santa Scorch this time. That was smart. So what I have to do now is just protect and trick room, or I mean fake out and trick room. They don't have taunt, right? Like, you can use Shadow Ball, but it's not going to really get you anywhere. Oh, 
Okay. Okay, so we have Degrassi Glide and High Horsepower and hope that the High Horsepower knocks out. The thing is, man, like without Life Orb, this is actually really bad. Like I'm, I'm seeing very quickly that I actually need Life Orb. If this doesn't KO, it doesn't, because I need Life Orb. <sighs> Dude. Oh my god, it's so bad. Why is Life Orb so important? Calyrex, man, come on. So we have the grassy glib. I'm gonna believe that glacial haunts can do this. I'm going to be hopeful and believe that glacial haunts can do this. Why did I click high horsepower? <sighs> the thing is, I don't think they can get out of this. Because I just wood hammer. And yeah, I have a rack when it in the back. So let's just wood hammer and glacial lens. BS. That was a, that felt like a really long game. Is that Ed? No, that was Jack. Right, because Ed was the last one. Oh, 
Okay, so that was interesting. That was pretty interesting. Let's see, what else can we talk about? <laughs> um, I mean, the thing is, like, this stuff is actually really important. So, like, me half-ass explaining it is not that great. Like, um, but, you know, it's what's up. And um, something else that I think about sometimes that is a very another very important aspect of the universe to think about um, is whether or not uh, fate and free will actually exist. Um, and it's kind of interesting. It's it's really um, it's the answer really in my opinion ends up being the same as the answer for good and evil. Um, oh, why is he so high already? Oh my god. Um, the answer to good and evil um, and fate really lies in what's called dialectic reasoning or dialectical uh, reasoning. So it's not, it's not like a this or that type of situation. It's really like a this and that type of situation. So like instead of saying that like good and evil don't exist, we say like good and evil doesn't exist but it also does exist because we've made it exist um in the the confines of our existence so it's a uh, that's kind of like the dialectical reasoning side of things like it's it's both a yes and a no and in modern logic that's kind of something that people frown upon like you can't have it be both yes and no at the same time but um I'm actually gonna try starting Calyrex here. And let's see, Calyrex, Rillaboom maybe? Let's try Calyrex Rillaboom with, do we want Araquanid? We want Snorlax. Do we want Araquanid? Let's take, Let's just take a rack one. But so yeah, you can use the the beautiful thing about it to me is that you can use dialectical reasoning to understand a lot of aspects of the universe that people have a really hard time grappling with. So, like fate and free will um is the same as good and evil in the sense that it's kind of like a yes and a no. Ooh, this is gonna be interesting. So, I mean, technically it's not actually a yes and a no for, for fate and free will based on our most modern understanding of science. Um, some people do like to believe that um, in the universe, you know, based on quantum physics, we can actually say that, ooh, that's interesting. Um, based in quantum physics, we most likely think that like, the future's not actually set in stone in some weird way, and that like, for the universe, um, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to think about what I'm doing. I need a high horsepower, and I need to, um, I'm gonna actually go for the knockoff again, even though it's, uh, it'll knock out, it'll knock out. Oh, 
if I flinch though. Are you absolutely kidding me? Why? Why is not Life Orb Calyrex so bad? It literally blows my mind. <laughs> oh my god, dude, like... So we have the Darkest Lariat and just Grassy Glide the stack. But like, that's it though. Like I, I have to make it Life Orb Calyrex. Like I have to. Chewy too chewy. So we have to fire punch the Venusaur, I think and possibly just like knock off somebody. We could switch out into a Raquanid. The problem that I'm seeing with that Well, first off, Venusaur could have a sash. Sorry, so I'll get back to what I was saying in a second. I just want to I just I just want to win, okay? I just want to win. Um I would really like to self-destruct here, but I don't think it's the move. So what I'm going to do is self-destruct. <laughs> no, here I just double protect. So what was I talking about? <laughs> um, we were talking about the nature of fate and free will. So yeah, when most physicists think about the universe, they think about the universe as um, being a place where technically, like in some weird way, the future is not set in stone. However, the way that I look at it is that I think I think saying that we can't predict the next moment based on the current moment is really um it's more a a side a side result of our incomplete theory of everything more than I think it's like an actual inherent quality of the universe. So when I think about the universe, I think like if you could capture an entire moment in the universe's life like the entire universe at once 
then I think you could technically predict what's going to happen next based in the, you know, physical complexities of everything that's happening at once, like basically predilects what's going to happen exactly after it. Um, but the thing about that is if the current moment can predilect the next moment, that means we can understand the state of the next moment, and through that, you could understand the state of the next moment. And so if we actually did have a fully complete theory of everything that showed that, um, you know, quantum, quantum physics does not actually make it so that, like, um, what's the word? Improbability, um, uncertainty. Um, and that's actually one of the really interesting things about it, too, is, like, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, uncertainty might not actually be a real thing. Um, I think uncertainty is a very important rule in physics for, like, understanding how quantum systems work. But if when we really think about uncertainty in the sense of, like, can we know what's going to happen next? I don't think that the universe is entirely random. I do think that there's a sort of metric to which you can understand what's going to happen next. And so that puts a really interesting perspective on our lives. Because what it really says is that even though we feel like we're choosing our actions, there's a sense in which our actions are also really like determined by all the complexities of what's happening in the universe or ourselves um, at once. And so even though to us, you're never gonna not feel like you, you're always gonna feel like you choose your actions. That's a part of your existence. Like you, your existence um, takes place within its own unfolding. So like, you literally are yourself experiencing the unfolding of yourself. Um, and because of that, even if good and evil, um, or sorry, even if fate is real, meaning that there is no um, free will, you're always gonna feel like you have free will anyways. So it just doesn't really matter. Like um, it's, it's, that's where the, the, the both yes and no thing comes in because it's like, um, Yes, there is technically no free will, but no, there technically is free will because even if for the universe's side of existence, um, everything we do is predetermined, from our side of existence, you are the experience of your own life and your own unfolding. So even if for the universe there is a categorical way to understand what you're going to do next, you are caught up in the very experience of being the person that is doing the thing that's going to lead you to what happens next. So like having the experience of free will is wrapped up in the confines of not actually having free will, um, which is kind of the beautiful thing about it in my opinion. Like. Um, even if free will is not a thing, we're always going to feel like we choose our actions because you are yourself caught up in the experience of becoming whatever is happening next, right? Um, so it's, it's really beautiful. Like the, the same way that, um, even if there's no good and evil, there technically is good and evil for life. Um, even if there is no, um, even if there is fate for us on our side of existence, there is no fate because we're always going to feel like we're the ones choosing what's happens next. Um, and it's really nice. And just like, just like the, uh, the, the good and evil consideration, what it also does is interestingly enough is there's no pragmatic application. So like, what a pragmatic application means is like, now that we know this, what should we do? Um, nothing. <laughs> you, just, you really just keep living the same way you were living and just appreciate the beauty of existence. And like, now that you know that like, 
even if there's fate, we still feel like we choose our own actions, so it doesn't matter. Like, um, you just kind of keep living the way you live and, like, try to be the best you can be. Like, it's, there's really, there's no, like, there's just no pragmatic application that changes out of it. Like, it doesn't tell us to do anything different. It's, it's just, okay, well, that's a thing. And you just kind of have to marvel at it and keep trying to be your best you. So, um, it's beautiful. But hopefully, um, that explained, that explained it. <laughs> um, I know I was rambling a lot in the beginning there, so I apologize. Um, I want to look at where I'm at in this. Participate in friendly competition. Really? Jack was that high? 